This morning we are talking about how Jesus takes care of us. Jesus takes care of us. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 5. We're going to read from there with your Bible, whatever, however you brought it. Read those verses first before we delve in. 1 Peter 5. Chapter, six, or chapter 5, 6 through 11. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you at the proper time, casting all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Be of sober spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. But resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. After you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. Father, I pray this morning, Lord, that you would speak through me in spite of me. Lord, as we stand and sit here this morning, we want to hear from you. We want your Holy Spirit to minister to each individual life here and to speak to us what you want us to hear and what you want us to apply to our life this morning. Thank you for your word. Thank you that, Father, Jesus does care for us. No one ever cared for me like Jesus. Thank you so much for that. Now be with us as we open our hearts and our minds to what you have for us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Christianity at its very beginning was seen as a Jewish faction. Toward the middle of the first century, it established itself as being unique from Judaism. From the very beginning of the church, Christians were persecuted for their faith in Jesus. At first, they were persecuted by the Jewish religious uh, uh, authorities, such as Saul, before he was converted, to Paul, you know, before his conversion. Later, the Roman Empire persecuted Christians. From Nero to the first century, to Diocletian in the first part of the fourth century, Christians were regularly martyred for proclaiming that Jesus was and is the Son of God. That's the difference of some different people and religions. When you as a believer says that Jesus is a prophet, some religions have no problem with that. If you as a Christian says Jesus was a good teacher or a rabbi, no problem with that. The minute you say Jesus is God, boom. That's where the rub comes in. That's where they start saying, no, you're wrong. The Bible's wrong. He wasn't God. And then that persecution starts coming. Because the Son of God saying that he was God is the issue. So throughout the Middle Ages, as you look at it, the Roman Catholic Church killed many believers because they didn't believe in their dogma. Today, it's communistic and Islamic countries uh, around the world. Christians uh, regularly face persecution and death for their faith. Even presently today, we have Voice of the Martyrs, and we support a missionary with Voice of the Martyrs. And they actually, we can't say where they are or what they're doing or who they are because they could be killed. But they are out there sharing the gospel, and many are still being persecuted for their belief today. Peter wrote this letter, as he wrote 1 Peter, he wrote this letter not only to a persecuted church, but to one that struggles with living out his or her faith. The difficulty many of us face is not necessarily persecution. You may not be persecuted like they were in the early church. Maybe at work you take a little bit of guff or something like that, but nothing like they do in other parts of the world or in the early church. But most of our struggles come from a failure to remain constantly under the lordship of Jesus Christ. That's where the struggle comes out. You'll see on the screen, the secret to an effective Christian life is found in his strength, not in our own. In living under his control and not under self-rule. Folks, it is easy to serve the Lord when times are good and it costs us nothing to hold our faith. It's easy. But then there are times... Then there are times when we grow weary, when we feel defeated, when it seems that circumstances of life will surely overwhelm us. It is in these moments like these, the, and it is in moments like these that we choose between dealing with life in our own strength or remaining dependent on the Spirit of God living within us. If you find yourself in that situation this morning, take heart. Take heart. God has a word of encouragement for you. His desire is to use these difficulties to strengthen you, to perfect and establish you, and to demonstrate to you how he wants to care for you. Again, that great old hymn, no one ever cared for me 
like Jesus. So, in this passage, we're going to look at six things that we can draw out of that to help us in times like these. Let's look at that first verse again. He says, Be therefore humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you at the proper time. Humble yourselves. That's a difficult thing. Well, let's look at the Greek word for humble. It could be translated, be humbled. In this case, it is the hand of God that is humbling us. The hand of God. We are being instructed to allow God to humble us. That's what Peter's teaching here. I need to allow God to humble me? Yes, if I really want to have humility and be humbled, I need to allow God to do that and quit resisting and fighting it. To the first readers, it was persecution that God used to humble them. To you and me, it could be the, uh, just the frustrations of everyday life. Isn't it been frustrated with 2020 so far? I mean, it's, there's a lot of frustrations. I tell you what, my wife who's in the nursery now, she was here early service. She was supposed to have cataract surgery. So we were away and we were out of the state of New Jersey and she couldn't have her cataract surgery even though she passed the COVID test. She was negative. She didn't have positive. It was negative. She couldn't have it because they couldn't do an EKG at her primary. So she was frustrated. You know, she's frustrated. So there's a lot of frustrations in life right now. Rather than complaining about them, we must submit to the Lordship of Christ. Only when we humble ourselves under God's hand will he exalt us. You'll see on the screen, Warren Wiersbe says, First the cross, then the crown. First the suffering, then the glory. <laughs> Sometimes, though, unfortunately, God uses tragedy and loss. No doubt, I see Hattie and Rebecca and the Aunt Retzel family, you lost your father, Hattie. And, and no doubt, there's bereavement, there's sadness, but there's also rejoicing because he's with his Savior, our Savior. And kind of jealous, aren't we, a little bit, because we want to be there. But that tragedy, it's a tragedy and loss. So, so even though God may have sent that calamity your way, he, he is able to use it for good. What does he say? All things are work together for good to those who love God and called according to his purpose. So our problem, as we hear about this on the screen, our problem is that we often won't accept the sovereignty of God in our lives. Is we won't accept the sovereignty of God in our lives. God is sovereign. Living on the delusion of self-rule, we complain, we struggle, we squirm. Oh, do we ever. We sound like the Israelites in the Old Testament. Allowing God to humble us means that we remember that who is in control? God is in control, not us. God is in control. Nothing will happen that he has not allowed. Nothing will happen that he has not allowed. When he allows it, there's a purpose and a goal for it, and that purpose is always for our good. Here's what it means. It means accepting all that happens to us without resentment or rebellion against God. It means accepting all that happens, all that happens to us without resentment or rebellion against God. It's interesting, whenever tragedy or loss or something comes our way, who gets blamed first? Well, if your husband, it's wife, your wife, your husband. But beyond that, it's usually God. Why, God, are you doing this? Why have this brought this in my life? Why is this happening? It's all your fault. You, you know, you could have taken care of it. We always blame God. Humility means accepting God's rule instead of ours. It means accepting his rule when we don't understand, and it means accepting his rule when he doesn't give us explanation. Ouch, that one hurts me. It means accepting his rule when we don't understand, and it means accepting his rule when we, he doesn't give us explanation. That's contrary to what we, we, we've got to know everything. I need to understand, and you know why. Give me an explanation. Come on, God. Why, why, why? I don't understand. But that means accepting God's rule instead of ours. The word humility in the Greek language is interesting. It means to make low, to abase, to make small, or to weaken. <laughs> Isn't that contrary, though, to human nature to be made low? <laughs> we don't want to be made low. It goes against the grain of our pride and our sense of self-worth to allow anyone or anything to weaken us or make us small. But in the kingdom of God, things are different than in the empires of man. The verse immediately before, look at that verse before. It says this, that God is opposed to the proud, but give grace to the humble. The rest of verse 6 says that at the proper time, that word proper time, God will exalt those who have been humbled. 
The reason that proper time never seems to be in harmony with our schedule is because as long as we are thinking we should be exalted, we are still nursing our pride. I wanted that on the screen so we could visually see that and hear it at the same time. We are still nursing our pride. It is not until our pride is dead that we will, he will exalt us. Humility means we lose our pride, but we gain God's favor. Lose our pride, gain God's favor. Lose our pride, gain God's favor. I think I like God's favor. When we are humbled, when we are made low a base and come to a sense of our own weakness, we will be forced to depend on him. Now, let's move on to verse 7 of this chapter, okay? I put on the screen three different versions because sometimes it just helps us to understand what he's saying. But the second point is be dependent. 1 Peter 5, 7, it says, casting all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. That's New American Standard. The New Living says, give all your worries and cares to God. For he cares about you. Then the King James, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. I put that up because all three, he cares for you. If I can drive anything through this morning, he cares for you. He cares for you. He cares for you. He cares for you. Whereas pride makes one self-reliant, humility positions us to recognize and accept our dependence upon God. The Greek word translated care or anxiety here is used to express the burden that comes with anxious care and apprehension. So instead of fighting this, we turn it back over to the Lord. Don't fight it. Turn it back over to the Lord. Because God is sovereign. He's in control no matter what we think. God is sovereign. If we are his, and I trust you are this morning, the only things that come to our lives are things he allows. In fact, listen to what Psalm 55, 22 says. Cast your burden upon the Lord and he will sustain you. He will never allow the righteous to be shaken. I love that Psalm. Praise the Lord for that. Cast your burden upon the Lord and he will sustain you. He will never, 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 never allow the righteous to be shaken. The interesting thing about this verse in Psalm 55 is that the Hebrew word translated burden means what he has given you. What? Yes, what he has given you. Here's a literal translation. It's very interesting. It might read this. Throw upon the Lord whatever burden he has assigned to you, and he will sustain you as you bear it. He will not allow you to totter. I love that literal translation. Give it to him. Whereas humility causes us to see our own weakness, dependence causes us to recognize and rely upon his strength. And when, within the context of Scripture, what Scripture is saying, we are being told that God often allows the difference to come our way to teach us both our own weakness and his supernatural strength. One of the problems with modern Christianity is this. It is nothing more than a self-help philosophy draped in religious garb. I'm sad to say that. In many different pulpits and TV things, that's what it is. Instead of preaching that we are to see ourselves as nothing and find all we are in Christ, notice what I said? See ourselves as nothing and find what we are in Christ. Many pulpits today preach a message basically says God helps those who help themselves. Nothing could be further from the truth of Scripture. Jesus never structured his, the purpose of God around thing, themes of self-importance or self-esteem. I know who I am because I'm in Christ. Christ is everything. What we're singing, Christ is everything. Everything is Christ for us. We are, who we are is found in Christ. Rather, what Jesus spoke about is take up a cross, laying down one's life for others following in the footsteps of one described as a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. Daily life with Jesus could seldom be described as, as, as uh, 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 described in terms of a purpose that brought no personal problems or freed him from daily spiritual battle. Think about the life of Jesus. The purpose for Jesus meant facing opposition at every turn, enduring persecution from those closest to you, and finally submitting to the full glory, fury of his father's wrath as he, stood, as, he, as he was nailed to a cross publicly for a crude and rude world. Would such a purpose find uh, any books in the American bookshelves today like that? 
Would, would there be a book that said, okay, to be a Christian, look what Paul had to go through. Here's the, here's the job description, what Paul wrote about being whipped, stoned, drowned, bitten by a snake, went without water, what, slept in the cold, all the things that he went through, and say, to be a Christian, this is what you sign up with. Would that be popular today? I don't know. I doubt it. But Peter here says this is, this is to persecuted Christians. He wrote to them, and he said dependence upon the Lord means, I think I have this on the screen, Chris, that instead of struggling with our cares, nursing our anxieties, and complaining about all God has allowed to come into our lives, we are to turn them back over to him, accepting the truth that he will sustain us because he cares for us. So in the midst of these difficulties, in the course of dealing with trials and tribulations, we must be on the alert, sober-minded, as it says, watchful, sober-minded. While the Lord wants us to, to, to use these things to develop us, the enemy will come to devour us. Look at verse 8. Look at verse 8, what it says. Be of sober spirit. Be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. So our third point is... It was be humble the first, be dependent, now be alert, be alert, be watchful. The verb sober and alert literally means to be mentally calm and alert, both at the same time. Mentally calm and alert, both at the same time. How is that possible? Well, instead of being anxious because we are depending upon the Lord, we can be mentally calm, and yet because we know we have an enemy, Satan, out there, we must be alert to the reality that our enemy wants to use every circumstance in our lives to destroy us. Folks, he wants to destroy you. Now, Peter, the imagery that Peter uses here is of a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. The literal meaning of this word translated devour, katapeno, means to consume, destroy, or to swallow up. I put this on the screen because here's what Satan, the enemy, wants to do. Satan is the enemy of all believers. Everyone in this room, a believer, and watching, he, you're an enemy of him. He's a, he, he, Satan is the enemy of all believers. He is the eternal enemy of our souls. From the very beginning of time in the Garden of Eden, Satan has sought to destroy all that God created to be good. Today, he seeks to destroy you and me as we seek to live the Christian life. Well, how in the world does he do this? You see on the screen the first one, temptation. He entices us to act contrary to God's plan, right here, God's plan, and displease him. Satan cannot have your soul, folks. We are sealed. No man shall pluck them out of my hand. You know, we're sealed by the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 1, Paul says that. And to salvation, he can't have, we can't lose it. He has us. Okay, Jesus. So if he, does, if he can't have your soul, what does he want to do? He wants your witness. That's what he wants. Can't have your soul, but he wants your witness. If he cannot have you for eternity, he wants to render you ineffective right now in the present. Right now. And boy, he does a great job. He does a great job at that. Because he knows human nature better than we do. Think about it. How long he's been around. He is an expert at appealing to our fallen nature, our carnal desires. Satan will use the strong desires we possess to tempt us and draw us from God. Thus, we must be sober and on alert. John writes in 1 John 2, 15 through 17. This is how he does it. Do not love, agape, I put that in parentheses, the world nor the things it offers you. For when you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you. For the world offers only a craving for physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see, and pride in our achievements and possessions. These are not from the Father, but are from this world. So before defining what it means to not love the world, let us consider what it does not mean. Not loving the world does not mean we should not love the people of the world. God clearly commands us to love everyone in the world, including our enemies. Look at the verses on the screen. Mark 12, 31. Love your neighbor as yourself. John 15, 12. This is my commandment that you, have one, love one, that you love one another just as I have loved you. Matthew 5, 44. This is the, the cherry on the top because we have no excuse for not loving people. But I say to you, love your enemies, even if it's your wife or your husband. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. So it doesn't mean that. We are to love people as believers no matter who they are. 
There's no choice in that. Of course, love the Lord God with our heart, soul, strength, and mind first, then love others and your neighbor as yourself. So not loving the world does not mean that we are to enjoy or not to enjoy or utilize the good gifts that God has given us. Look what James says in 117. Every good thing given, every good thing given, every perfect gift is, gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. See, God provides us with many wonderful, good things to enjoy, and we ought to receive them with thanksgiving. Paul says that, 1 Timothy 4.4, 4, For everything created by God is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with gratitude. So what does it mean that we are not to love the world? Well, first, we need to understand that it's not the created world itself. People send pictures of sunsets and different mountain scenes as gorgeous as the beach. It's not that. It's not the, it's, that is not sinful. But the rebellious, anti-God system of the world. You say, what is that? Well, the spirit, little less, of this world comes from the God of this world, Satan, in certain ways. Look at Ephesians 2, 1 through 3. It's on the screen. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, this is Satan, of the spirit, little less, that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them we too all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 2.12, Now we have received not the Spirit, little s, of the world, but the Spirit, big S, Holy Spirit, who is from God, so that we may know the things freely given to us by God. And the last point that I'm making here about the Spirit of this world, Satan, 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, In whose case the God, little g, of this world, has blinded the minds of the unbelieving, so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is in the image of God. Folks, many times in my life I have said, man, I didn't witness to them right. I didn't share the gospel right. Oh, man, the things I learned from Pastor Frank, the Romans Road, or EE, -E, I, I messed that up and I didn't present it right, but I did present Christ and all this stuff. And, and I get down on myself, say, why didn't they come to know Christ? Why can't I lead somebody to Christ? Why aren't they coming to know Christ? Why are, why, why did, are my sisters and brother-in-law since 1974 ha haven't come to Christ? It's my fault. It's my fault. And I put this on myself and I'm going, wait a minute. And this verse popped out and said, whoa, whoa, whoa. And this is just a sidebar for you for encouragement. In whose case the God of this world has done what? Has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they may not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God. That brought me such relief. I said, oh, okay, at least there's one thing in my life that's not my fault. You know, most of the things my wife said, it's your fault, your fault. She's in a nursery, I can say this now. I couldn't say this early service. But anyhow, you know, <laughs> oh, she can see this on Facebook. Oh, I love you, honey. Anyhow, who's the image of God, right? But John here, he makes it clear specifically what he is referring to when he forbids us from loving the world. Namely, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. All of these attitudes are sinful and rebellious against God and his will for us. The lust of flesh, here's what it includes, sin such as sexual immorality, gluttony, and other indulgences. The lust of the eyes is the root of covetousness. It is the greedy desire for the material riches and possessions of this world. Finally, the pride of life is, is boasting of ambition and achievement, a thirst for the honor bestowed by and the applause received from the world. The pride of life leads to boasting about what we have or do. And Jesus, Jesus himself was tempted in all three areas here. You can read about that later in Matthew 4, 1 through 11. But those things, the applause, remember the old hymn, I'd rather have Jesus? than silver or gold. I'd rather have Jesus than applause him. You, you look at that verse. It's in our hymnal if you ever want to look at it. It's a great, and also no one ever cared for me. Look at those two hymns. The words are awesome. They minister to your heart. I'd rather have Jesus. That's the key. That's the key. Notably, Jesus, when he was tempted, quoted the word of God in response to Satan's temptation. Think about it. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Hmm, that's Jesus. So the Word quoted the Word. Okay? So as you look at that, in contrast to the manifestations of the love of the world, lust of the eyes, lust of flesh, pride of life, Christians are commanded to what? Imitate Christ. 
So as we look at that temptation that Christ went through, we are to imitate him. That's why with our children and our young people and even adults, we say, memorize the word of God. So you can use it against Satan when he tempts you and tries to devour you. Look at Titus 2, 11 through 14. I think for time I put it on the screen, so I apologize for that. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in this present age, looking for the blessed hope, oh, aren't we ever looking for the blessed hope, and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from every, every lawless deed, and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds." We know that when a person is converted to Christ, he becomes a new creature. We've said that before from this platform. With new desires, the old selfish, sinful nature is put to death, and the new nature is, is, brought, is brought about by the Holy Spirit when he comes to, to our life. Worldly passions belong to, not to our new nature, but to our old nature, and, and as such are to be denied. Earlier in this book, in chapter 1, in 1 Peter 1, 14 through 16, we read, As a Obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts, which were yours, in your ignorance. But like the Holy One who called you, behold yourselves also in all your behavior. Because it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. So instead of living to ourselves, we now live for Christ. Paul says, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Instead of seeking to follow our selfish will, we now seek to do God's will. The world is passing away, and also its lust, but the one who does the will of God lives forever. So instead of being conformed to the values and attitudes of this world, folks, we are to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. Paul says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. So, our love for Jesus must be greater than our love for anyone or anything in this world. I, I had to read that several times. Our love for Jesus must be greater than our love for anyone or anything in this world. Now, my wife was here, and I, I turned to her, and I said, Honey, I have to love Jesus more than you, and you have to love Jesus more than me. That's hard to say. Now, I'm not putting my grandkids over my wife, but it's hard. Gavin's the only one that ever's in the nursery, but Gavin, I'm sorry. I'd love Jesus more than you. I mean, you're awesome. You're cool. You're the firstborn, first grandchild. You get everything. But you didn't know that, did you? But I have to love Jesus more than you, Gavin, more than little Kenzie, your sister. Little Kenzie. I have to love all Jesus more than all my grandchildren. That's hard as a grandparent. But that's what's saying. Our love for Jesus must be greater than our love for anyone or anything in this world. If we love the world predominantly, then we love the love of God is not in us. To love God above this world, we must continually renew our minds with the word of God and set our minds primarily on what is spiritual instead of what is earthly. Paul says Colossians 3, 1 through 4, and this is a great verse to have. Therefore, if you have been raised, you have been, with Christ, we're, 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 we're here physically, but we're going to be, it's a reassurance we're going to be raised, keep seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Folks, right here is, is one of my issues that, that causes problem in my life. Set your mind on things above. When I don't set my mind on things above and I lower it to a horizontal view, boom, Satan gets me. I sin. I'd have to argue with Paul. I believe I'm the chief of all sinners, not Paul when he said that. We'll have to have an argument into heaven. But I believe that I am that. I have sinned before holy God, and I don't want to. I don't desire it, but I have, and I will continue, unfortunately. But the nice thing about this, the greatest thing, is if we are faithful, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just forgive us our sins, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's like, spiritually, I, I, I'm broken with my relationship, and I've got, you know, I was, uh, you have to use Drano to get your 
pipes unclean, you know, unclogged. I'm clogged up because of my sin. When I confess it, my pipes are clean, and that spirit can run through me now, and I'm cleansed, and I'm really fully functioning now. And that's what happens. So when I set your mind, that's why Paul said, set it on the things above, not on things. For you have died with Christ. Another way is deception. Oh, he causes us to believe things about God and ourselves that are not true. Since we always act out of what we believe, we must believe what is true. You know, you have power over what you believe. But what you believe has power over you. I'm to repeat that. You have power over what you believe. You have power over what you believe here. But, you, but what you believe has power over you. Does it? Yes, it does. Scripture says that the devil is the father of all lies and a deceiver. He will appear as an angel of light, even, it says in Scripture. He will get us to do his bidding, making us think we are somehow seeking, serving God. We have the word of God to lead us down the pathway of righteousness, to be a light into our path and a lamp into our feet. Then, this is a big one, he uses discouragement. Folks, 2020, have we not been discouraged? Oh my goodness, there's discouragement everywhere. The devil has a way of causing us to question whether or not living for Christ is worth it. Is it really worth it? Look what I'm going through. Is it really worth living for Christ? The psalmist presses it this way. But as for me, my feet almost slipped. My steps nearly went astray. For I envied the arrogant. I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Psalm 73, 2 and 3. There are times in life when troubles come our way. And we look at the godless and their lives seem to be trouble free. We look at them and say, wow, look at them. They don't seem to have any trouble in the world. Oh, wow. Look, they won the lottery and they bought a lottery mansion and all this stuff. They don't have any problems at all that we know of. But it seems that way. But, and, and it is in these moments that we are tempted to question our faith. That's when we question our faith, to question the life we live and whether or not living for Christ is worth what we must endure. I put this on the screen. The devil loves discouragement. He loves to get us on self-pity kicks, to take our focus off of Christ and to put our focus on ourselves. When we are totally surrendered, totally surrendered to the control of Jesus, we will not focus on ourselves. We won't do that. But rather on what it is God wants to do through whatever he has allowed to come into our lives. The difference is between an egocentric life or a Christocentric life. The devil wants to devour us like a roaring lion. But instead of giving in to his tricks, his temptations, deceptions, and discouragement, we are told to resist steadfast in our faith. So the fourth says, stand firm. Stand firm. When we have humbled ourselves and found our strength in God, when we have learned the secret of dependence, and when we remain on our guard against the devil, we stand our ground. There is a direct relationship between a strong faith and the ability to live an overcoming life. Ephesians 6 says, take up the shield of faith and having put on the whole armor of God, we will be able to stand firm against the struggles of the devil. James says that submit therefore to God, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Here in 1 Peter 5 he says, we are told to resist the devil firm in your faith. So when our faith is strong, when our endurance, confidence in God is unshaken, it is then and then alone that we have turned the battle over to the Lord's. I love what David stood before Goliath in Samuel 17, 47. He said, the battle is the Lord's. In Exodus, as Moses and his people stood between the Red Sea and the armies of Pharaoh, Moses told the Israelites, the Lord will fight for you while you keep silent. While you keep silent. Boy, there's times where I have to, oh man, I, I, I debate with God, I argue with God, I blame God. I got to keep silent to God. This is the, the, the Lord, you'll fight. This is your fight, not mine. Throughout scripture, whenever God's people stood firm in their faith, God came through. Whether it was Daniel in the lion's den, whether it was Paul and Silas of Philippian jail, when people put their trust in God, he came through. Resist the devil. Stand firm. He will come through for you. Don't give up, folks. Don't give up. Don't give in to discouragement. Do not give the devil a foothold. Stand firm. That military firm, stand firm in your faith. Fifth, be prepared, because be prepared for the persecution that will come. Believe me, it's coming. Paul said, indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ, Jesus will be persecuted. As Peter, upon the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, was, was writing this, he wrote these words to the other church, uh, because persecution of Christianity was spreading. 
In July of the year 64, Nero set a fire in Rome. Nero was one crazy leader uh, that devastated the city. So needing a scapegoat, guess what? He lays the blame on Christians. So what happened? The, the result was the Christians were beaten, tortured, and many were killed. Some were thrown into the arena where they were torn apart by wild beasts. Others were boiled in oil. Can you imagine? But this last one is just sick. Encased in wax and burned at the stake like candles to light his garden so he could see at nighttime to walk through. Can you imagine that kind of persecution? For the latter part of three centuries, Christians would be persecuted until 313, the, the Roman Emperor Constantine issued the Edict of Milan and declaring religious freedom for all faiths, including Christians. Perhaps there is no pertinent message the church needs to hear today than this one. It will get worse before it gets better. Oh, but that's gloom and doom. Folks, it will get worse before it gets better. What did Paul say in, in Timothy? In the last days, perilous times will come. You know, many pastors, we feel that the best we can hope to do is to retard the spread of evil in our culture. We will not change this culture. We just won't. Why? Because the Word of God says that. Our hope, though, here's the exciting part. Our hope is in the triumphant return of Jesus Christ to this earth. Amen. Our hope is in the eternal life he promises. This world is not our home. We are pilgrims, strangers, and sojourners. We will suffer here for a while. That cannot be avoided. But after we have suffered for a little while, look at the last part of verse 10. Look what it says. The last part. I think it will be on the screen, Chris. This world is not our home. Be assured. First Peter. No, go ahead. Flip, flip to the next one. After you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. Here, we have the promise that as God accomplishes his purpose in us, there are four things he will do. Notice the adjective, though, first Peter used to describe God. He is the God of all grace. God loves us. He loves you and me. His purpose in allowing persecution and suffering is motivated by even nothing more than perfect love for us. He is the God of all grace. He will have mercy on us. As we stand firm in our faith and resist the devil, God will do these four things. I put them up here because of time. Perfect us. To bring us to wholeness, nothing lacking, complete us in every way. Confirm us. The idea here is to make us firm. Again, rather than being uncertain and weak, we will be resolute and determined in our faith. He will strengthen us. He will use the difficulties to make us stronger, to enable us to face anything he allows us to, to, allows to come our way. That's why Paul said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthen me. Establish us. The picture the Greek paints for us is of a foundation that is not shaky, but is settled and is firmly founded. I had a friend send me something through the email, and, and Shelly, I told you, it was on your Facebook thing, your post, and I'm going to say it this morning. Marriage is hard. Divorce is hard. Choose your hard. Obesity is hard. Being fit is hard. Choose your hard. Being in debt is hard. Being financially disciplined is hard. Choose your hard. Communication is hard. Not communicating is hard. Choose your hard. Living the Christian life is hard. Not living the Christian life is hard. Choose your hard. Life will never be easy. It will always be hard. But we can choose our hard. Pick wisely. You can choose to allow the Lord to humble you. You can choose to be dependent on him and stand firm in all the things we covered this morning. You can choose that. Pick wisely. You can choose your hard. Pick wisely. Pick wisely. What are you going through this morning? Maybe life hasn't turned out the way you thought it should or the way you planned. Perhaps the, the cares and burdens of life seem just more than you can bear. Don't fight it. Let God use these things to humble you and cause you to depend upon him. I read a, uh, two books while I was on vacation, and, and the one I read it really ministered to my heart. And there was a prayer in there by this, the author. And I, I made a copy and put it in the bulletin this morning. If you didn't get one, they're, they're in the bulletin. But I, I want to pray this this morning because what a way to end our message this morning about how Jesus cares for us. 
and it talks about humility, grace, and surrender. My wife and I are praying this every morning because it's changed my heart. It's realized where I've fallen short, and I want God to, to humble me and to keep me in that position of humility, to, to understand his grace and to surrender so I don't sin before a holy God. So let's bow our heads this morning, and I'm going to pray this for us this morning. God, I humble myself before you today. You are God and I am not. You are wiser, more powerful, and you alone are the source of all knowledge and truth. I am a created being below you, and I depend upon you for my next breath. I am open to learn from you and others today. I see this day as an opportunity to serve others with the gifts and talents you've given me. I am not better than anyone I will see or be with today. We are all equal in your sight. We are all dependent on you for life. I am under your authority and protection. Father, now grace. Father, thank you for forgiving me. I confess my pride, my greed, my envy, my anger, my judgmental thoughts, and my victim mentality to you. I am a sinner by nature and choice. I need your forgiveness. Thank you for dying in my place and rising again that I may be accepted in your sight. Thank you that I am forgiven, accepted, and adopted into your family, and that nothing and no one can snatch me from your hands and your care. Thank you for loving me deeply and completely through your Son. I receive this amazing, transforming, accepting grace. Because you accept me just as I am, I in turn can accept others. God, I also receive your empowering grace today. Thank you for the grace that keeps me centered and focused on you during the task that you need to be accomplished today. Thank you that your grace is sufficient for me today. That you will provide the strength and the power that I do not naturally possess. Thank you that your power, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead, lives in me. Thank you that even though I feel weak and feeble this morning, I know you are strong, which makes me strong in you. God, I set my mind and heart to continually turn to you throughout the day for strength and power. In all the meetings I have, all the appointments, all the interactions with others, I will call upon your name and your power to see me through. Now, Lord, surrender. Lord, I give you my worry and anxiety, casting all your anxiety on him because Lord you care for me I let go of trying to control all the people in my life I let go of the outcomes and results that I am not responsible for I surrender I stop playing God this morning and surrender to you to you your will God I give you my will in exchange for your will I set my heart and mind to do your will, your way. I choose to work hard for you. I choose to serve others in everything I do. I choose to get my eyes off myself, my worries, my burdens, my chaos, and I turn that over to you in order to focus on others. Father, I trust you with everything. You did not make me to understand everything in this life. I give to you all the whys so that I may do the what's of this very day. Thank you that you do care for me and that you are using all things to make me stronger, wiser, and more equipped to take on the life you have for me today. Thank you for Jesus Christ, who is the incarnation of humility, grace, and surrender. I give everything to you and surrender to you in this moment. In Jesus' name we pray.